All participants have been placed on mute. If you wish to ask a question or make a comment during the session or during the presentation portion of the session, which will be brief, uh, please make a comment in the chat uh, area. The chat should be found at the bottom of your screen there. And uh, use this uh, window throughout uh, to post your questions and comments. Once we enter the interactive portion uh, of this session, we uh, will ask you to, to unmute yourself if you'd like to speak and contribute to the discussion uh, around the process that we'll be introducing to you today. All participants have been placed on mute, as I said, so, so please, uh, if you do accidentally come off mute, um, uh, we, we do like during the sessions to, uh, to keep everyone silent in the background. So now let's go ahead and get started. Let me introduce to you uh, Barbara Ballon. Barbara's gonna start off the first portion of this session. Barbara? Thanks, David. Uh, and thanks to all of you who have joined us today. We had a quite a large group on Wednesday. And it's awfully nice sometimes to have a smaller group because they can really get a lot of discussion going for this. What you're going to hear today is first, I'm going to give you the background on why we're going down this trail on the competency-based mastery learning. I will say to you that my opinion on this is that this is a major game changer for academics as a whole. So let me start off by telling you about eight months ago, the major buzzword in Washington, D.C., especially those who have money to throw at things, was the word apprenticeships. So that got our interest at the, at the National Cyber Watch Center. And interestingly enough, this past August, we had several of our college members, our faculty, give presentations about what they were doing from their school on apprenticeships. Many of them had been given quite substantial amounts of money to do something. And what we heard from everyone who has been trying to stand up apprenticeships is the following. There has never been a problem with getting students involved. That students love the idea, whether they're, whether they're college students or whether they're, they're um, you know, already working in the workplace and want to be upskilled, finding students was not an issue. Also, the content of the courses, the content was very sound. That didn't seem to be an issue. What the issue was and the failure point for all of these attempts was that when they went out to the employers to try to build a case for hiring these cyber apprentices, they got major pushback and the answer was typically no. So some of these grants where the, where, the, where the grantee said, oh yeah, we'll train 500 new apprentices. They may have trained five or 10. Nowhere, nowhere near their goal. So it was very frustrating. So for us at, at the management team at the National Cyber Watch Center said, okay, what do we do about this? Is there a solution for this? And just about the time that we were listening to all these presentations in August, the Department of Labor uh, released their solicitation for the development of national apprenticeship programs. Now, this wasn't just for cyber. They opened this up to plumbers and you know electricians and welders and whatever, but, but they had very, very specific guidelines and they said it must be a national program, not a regional to solve a national issue. And so we took notice of that and said, whoa, wait, we think we have something here. So um, our decision was to go out to all our members, our two and four year academic members within National Cyber Watch and ask them who was interested in partnering with us on this national solution. So we did build the team, I have a wonderful, wonderful group that's involved right now, and the grant of course has been submitted, so we're sitting back and waiting for, for news on that. But here's the important piece. For us in this grant solicitation, we focused on the IT incumbent workers. They already have a job, they're already known to the employers, and we are offering to upskill them. So the term that we are using is skill up, to scale up, and basically what we're doing is giving these IT workers who, again, already have a skill, and they're already being employed, giving them more so that we're, they're positioned to go into some critical areas within cybersecurity. There are four 
uh, fundamental courses and one capstone course, which is the uh, fundamentals of cybersecurity, which gets them into there. And then they can make their own decision on whether they would rather go into, say, digital forensics or the uh, cyber analyst or whatever networking. So whatever, that will be their decision. But it, we're looking at this that the millions of millions of IT workers that are already out there have some skills, and so they're not starting with zero. What this grant will be providing then is to give them an absolutely solid foundation upon which to then move into uh, specific areas of cybersecurity. So that was the logic behind this, but we didn't stop there. We knew if this had to be a national solution, it was going to have to be an online course. But those of you who have been involved in online education, you know, some are good, some are not so good. So what we did was we, in the master plan, we have our partners offering mentors because everybody gets stuck in a course. Everybody comes to that the head scratcher moment and says, what in the world do I do? That's the time when you really need, an adult really needs to go in and talk with somebody who's a subject matter expert and get out of that rut that they're in or, or get over that hurdle of learning something. So again, the, our design for this has our, has our academic and some of our business partners offering labs and lab time that someone taking the courses can come in and talk with uh, a, a mentor. So, so we use the term guide on the side for that. So where is all this going? That part sounded really good. We thought we had, you know, logistically how this could set up. We had the content that was going into it. But then to differentiate our content from anybody else's, the courses, the online courses that are being developed for this effort really are utilizing the competency-based mastery learning solution for this, which is very different than the uh, just typical uh, classroom that you're used to or the online. So let me advance to the next slide here if I can get there. There we go. Uh, boom. Okay, so these modules aren't being developed by one person. We are using the power of our National CyberWatch Center Curriculum Standards Panel. Some of our panels are made up of 150 subject matter experts, which include the faculty as well as practitioners. And, and again, they are determining what's fluff, what can be left out, what is the absolute kernel of a particular area that must be in so that when the student learns it, they are, again, they are fully prepared to go on to the next piece that they have to learn. So as I mentioned, we have identified five core foundational courses, which will all be online, all using the, the competency-based uh, mastery learning approach to this. And for those of you who don't, uh, don't have a real good grasp of what CBML is, we're gonna be, should we be showing you something very specific today? Because one of the pieces is, while we've been good as faculty at giving information, we haven't been real good at finding out what portions of the information our students didn't understand. So this is the big change, applying this theory of failed understanding. That involves the testing and the online materials have lots of pretests and tests and post tests and measurements going all the way through it because we need to trap where that learner is failing to understand something or has a really terrible misconception because you can't build on that. Uh, I often, often talk about learning as, as sort of the Swiss cheese method of learning. What we're doing here is not Swiss cheese, is a major foundational um, educational enterprise. And we do find out from the student what they don't understand because we have to plug that hole before we can move, let them move on. Now, again, we're used to having students go through our courses. We give them A, Bs, and Cs or passing grades. That's not it. This method really is that they understand 100% of what's presented to them and the online exercises show that they are capable of taking that educational content and marrying it with an action to be able to do or produce something. So that's, uh, again, what you have here then. And just think about this. 
when you teach your higher level courses, wouldn't you love to have all your students coming into that course with no failure points, that they've grasped everything they need to before they walk into your class? We know that's not the typical reality. We know that we got, we got our students and we sort of had to judge where they are. And sometimes then we start backtracking and filling in concepts they should have picked up in an earlier course. And without that concept, they can't do well in our course. So it really is, this particular method is, is always finding out where your students are, where they're failing, where their understanding has to be bolstered before they can move on. So let me move to the next slide here. And this brings us to today. The creation of exams, tests, has been something that most of the courses already come with test banks. That's never been a problem. It helps us to speed up the process of designing our, our own um, tests for our, for our classes. But today you're gonna have a chance to look at a different type of design where we're not just finding out what the student knows, but if they don't know, if their answer indicates that they're really off the deep end or they just don't understand this concept, we will know how to go back and remediate. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to David and he's gonna start talking to you about this process. And it really isn't that difficult. There's some piece parts to it, but I'm telling you the, what you'll end up with is something much more robust for your classes. And again, this will be embedded within the online classes, hopefully for when we get the good news that we've been funded by this big DOL grant and have a chance to change the face of the IT incumbents within our country. So thanks, David, it's all yours. Thanks, Barbara. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about what makes these uh, questions so different. So this is an example of a concept uh, or a competency-based mastery learning question. Uh, it's what's called a concept inventory. There actually are three different kinds of inventories that we build in competency-based mastery learning. The first is this, which is seeking to understand someone's proficiency uh, in understanding a particular issue. And then there is an action inventory associated with determining their level of skill and applying these uh, concepts in, in a procedure. And then finally, there are judgment inventories which are used to determine someone's ability to adapt their knowledge and skill into a different situation. But this today, we're gonna to focus on uh, the concept inventory question. So the concept inventory question has three major components to it. It has, of course, a question stem. That would be a statement with a fill in the blank or a, 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 you know, a statement looking for a particular answer. Um, uh, the kind of thing you would typically see in, in any form of assessment in, in today's education. But what makes this very different is really the two things that come after it. First, unlike most typical questions, uh, this one has only a single answer option. And the individual uh, learner must decide, is that answer correct or incorrect? So in that sense, it's more similar to a true-false type structure. But what makes this very unique is that uh, answer option, of course, there is the correct answer option, but we actually look to develop multiple correct answer options. So the individual isn't you know, certain every time this particular uh, question option is randomly chosen on the test bank, they're not sure whether that choice is gonna be correct or incorrect. They have to kind of think about it. Is this one of the correct answers or is it one of the incorrect answers? And then the next part, which is, key to diagnosing their uh, type of understanding is the confidence rating. And as you can see here, it's a scale that ranges from very confident in being correct to very confident that this is the incorrect answer with a placeholder in the middle for, you know what, I don't know, I'm gonna guess, I really don't know. And so I'll just say I don't know. And the scoring of these is, we're not gonna get into today, it's discussed in a previous um, brown bag lunch, uh, as, as well as other examples were provided in previous brown bag lunches. So we would encourage you to, uh, to listen to those webcasts if you've not had an opportunity to join us for, for those earlier in the year. Uh, but the, the key point is to know that the, the scoring design is to encourage people to become very reflective learners. They don't know which answer they got right or wrong specifically, but what they do get is feedback that indicates whether they've been overly confident in their wrong answers 
uh, and therefore they should become reflective about which of these topics do they truly understand and which ones do they not understand. And what evidence is increasingly showing us is that form of reflective learning enables them to become deeper in their learning, deeper in their understanding, and it actually begins to accelerate their learning because they get better and better at identifying what they don't know. That's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know what I don't know, somewhat made famous in our world by Donald Rumsfeld <laughs> in the famous unknown unknown. But the Dunning-Kruger effect suggests that without intervention, an individual will struggle in learning things when they don't know what they don't understand. But if they can become reflective about what they don't understand, and these, these types of inventories are designed to do that, they not only get better at that specific concept in terms of understanding it or applying it, but they also become more effective at studying, at learning, at ingesting information because they get better, if you will, they get raised emotional intelligence about their understanding. And we've seen dramatic improvements in learning speed and in learning depth as a result of using the concept inventory question format. So in, to give you an idea of what this looks like, we will ask you today to participate in an exercise in developing some of these. Uh, and each of you will be assigned a card in our Google slide. At, what you see here at the bottom is the link to that. So I would ask that you uh, uh, come into the presentation uh, by typing in that URL uh, in your browser. It will bring you uh, to the, the slide deck. And then we'll ask you to search for your name in the slide deck, and of course it'll just say, uh, you know, it just shows name here as a blank, but your names will actually be listed uh, on a card. And uh, if for some reason you've joined late um, or did not enter your full name or, or an indication of who you were in the Zoom, uh, if you could uh, go ahead and just scroll down, you'll see some blanks and you can type your name um, in there. And then uh, enter a concept that uh, you, wanted to have a question about, we've asked what you might bring with you um, uh, at Test Bank to, to refer to, to get some ideas on prompts and answers. Uh, we will also show you today an online bank that you could use for this purpose, as well, of course, uh, we'll walk through a couple examples for you. But you would pull the, the question out of the Test Bank, enter that in the prompt. Typically, you'll find you'll need to reword it um, to, to make it align with this concept inventory format. M the most important uh, reason for rewording is to ensure that there are indeed multiple correct answers. If you think about it, if there's only one correct answer in a multiple choice test with four possibilities, well, an individual can kind of guess, you know, if they were asked which ones are right and which ones are wrong, well, three out of four are wrong. So um, they can almost not know anything and just guess three out of four are wrong and be, you know, accurate. Um, and we don't want them to guess. We want them to, to really think about their answers. And so we, we try to get roughly the same number of correct answers as incorrect. It's okay if there's one more, if you will, on either side. But we'd like to roughly have a balance between correct answers and incorrect answers. And then those would be produced into these single item uh, questions, uh, which are displayed to the learner um, off of a, uh, out of a randomized selection from the item bank. So now to give you a very specific example in the cybersecurity domain, I'm going to turn it over to Casey. We'll walk you through the process of developing one of these. Casey, you're up. Thanks, David. Can you unshare so I can share my screen just for a couple minutes? Thank you. Okay, you should be seeing my presentation slide, can you? We're going to see it, Casey, thanks. Very good. Okay, so quickly, I, I chose a domain from an information security fundamentals type course. Perhaps you're teaching a similar type of concept or domain in say any, any, any sort of intro to IT security type class, CompTIA security plus type class. Um, so perhaps you're, you're teaching this course already and, and, and this example would apply to, to that type of, type of course. So you see I put the concept there. Uh, and, then, and then the question, I posted, by the way, some sample questions. If you didn't come with some sample test bank questions, I, I posted one in the chat room. And let me move my toolbar over here. And so there's, a, there's some sample questions there you can use. And I, I pulled one from that. So the original question that I pulled from the sample test bank URL that I posted in the chat room 
was, quote, which of the following terms is used in conjunction with the assumption that the output of a cryptographic function should be considerably different from the corresponding plain text input? Select all that apply. And I did a couple of things. The first thing I actually did, I actually did this with David and Barbara in preparation for this presentation. The first thing the three of us did was reword it to a singular choice question. And that's what I'm showing on my screen. Blank is a method to ensure there are no clues of any sort in an encrypted message that can be used to determine the plain text message. So this is part of, let me just pull up a quick PowerPoint slide here. This is part of a uh, instructional discussion around the concepts of confusion and diffusion, which have to do with, with ways in which you make sure that the resulting ciphertext from some encryption process doesn't leak information that would allow a crypto analyst or somebody trying to figure out what is either the plain text of that ciphertext or information that would allow them to derive the key, right? A special, a special code or phrase or word that's used in conjunction with the plain text message and an encryption algorithm, right? And those are essentially the quick down and dirty um, differences between the concepts of confusion and diffusion, all right? So as part of that, part of wanting to see if students have mastered those concepts, we can use then these concept inventories. And so here is the reworded question and you'll see I have the correct answers, a couple of them on the left. Diffusion is the correct answer. And then answer number two under the correct answer section on the green there, uh, green box there on the left is in essence the definition of diffusion. And the difficulty in creating this question was, was a couple of things. One, just being able to reword the definition of the correct answer such that it made sense in a fill in the blank type um, question or the prompt section that I've highlighted there. Um, and the other, the other challenge, quite frankly, was just that the, the question, the original question needed to be reworded. Um, it was it was hard to understand really what the the original um, question was asking for, and in, on top of it, it had an incorrect answer. So it it essentially needed the original question needed completely re, re rewritten, and we did that as a singular choice question. And then the other the other challenge really in creating these types of questions is just when it, it really has to do with coming up with why the answers are incorrect. And it's a challenge only in so far as you, know, you need to think about why it's a challenge. Um, and so I, there are four comments on my slide here that describe why each of these four answers are incorrect. And they have to do with things like obfuscation, for example, is an incorrect answer because the action of making the plain text obscure or unclear may still provide clues that, say, a crypto analyst could use to determine the plain text given an encrypted message. Um, and then the other, the other an incorrect answers, number two, three, and four, have to do with applying terms incorrectly in the case of collision, which is a concept that's part of typical introductions to cryptography, but it applies to hashing concepts, not uh, encryption, for example, concepts or uh, decryption. Uh, and then the other answers have to do with, um, you know, there's, there are explanations for answers three and four as to why those are incorrect. So um, that question took a, a little longer just because I had to, we had to reword it and then th really think through why the answers were incorrect. And then um, slide nine shows another example of how we took an original question, which was, quote, which of the following terms illustrates the security through obs obscurity concept, select all that apply, end quote. And we reworded that to a singular choice question provided in this case, uh, a number of correct answers. Um, and then with a number of incorrect answers. And again, then um, described why each of the incorrect answers was in fact incorrect. So David, I'll turn it back over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Okay, thanks, Casey. All right, so what we would like you to do then uh, is uh, go ahead and go 
find your card. Um, and you'll notice there were there are some other examples in here that others have done on the previous session. So you'll, if you want to look at some, maybe some different examples, you could also look at those as well. And then at the bottom of, of the slide will be, um, which doesn't show unfortunately in presentation mode, but will be a set of instructions. Uh, we ask that you basically copy and paste the concept question to the card to, uh, um, you know, put it into the prompt area and uh, then um, you know, enter your concept, uh, enter your question prompt, replace the correct answer uh, with at least two, preferably three or four possible correct answers to the question, and then replace the incorrect answers with two, uh, at least two, but preferably three or four possible incorrect answers. Uh, and then after you've entered your correct and incorrect answers, if you would highlight uh, any one or preferably each one of the incorrect answers and then choose uh, the insert comment by either selecting comment from the right click menu or selecting uh, insert comment from the uh, Google Slides menu. Or I believe you can also type control alt M at least on a PC, not sure what the equivalent would be on a Mac. Uh, and uh, it would then uh, pop up an opportunity for you to enter a comment about that incorrect choice to indicate why you believe someone might choose to uh, to select that option uh, if as the correct option. So with that, uh, let's turn you loose to work on your cards. If you have questions, comments as you're going throughout the process. Uh, at this point, again, we don't have a large number of folks on the call, so please feel free to unmute yourself if you don't mind being recorded, and uh, and in, you know give us your thoughts and your comments and your questions. Otherwise, we'll also be monitoring the chat room uh, as we uh, continue through the rest of the session. Okay, we've got roughly around seven minutes left in our scheduled time for today. We do like to keep all of our sessions, uh, the brown bag lunch session, within a lunch time. Uh, so we uh, planned it for 45 minutes. Uh, again, please, if you do have questions, comments, uh, concerns, ideas, anything you'd like to share about the process that we've walked through today, uh, please feel free to add a comment in the chat. Or, uh, or unmute yourself and, and raise your, your point directly to the group. I want to remind everyone that these uh, the virtual brown bag lunch sessions, again, are uh, an output of our curriculum standards effort. And we're always looking for new folks to, to join the effort. So if you're uh, interested in participating in developing national standards for curriculum design, assessment, instructional content, uh, exercises, labs, et cetera, uh, we would welcome your input on the curriculum standards panels. I've posted uh, in the chat, the link to our page on the website that talks more about that. And also for those who might have interest in learning more about CompC-based mastery learning, our most recent issue of the Cybersecurity Skills Journal uh, addressed that issue. And again, I posted in the chat a link uh, to that issue. If you'd like to learn more about the terms and phrases used in, uh, in uh, CompC-based mastery learning, um, or how it might be applied in terms of understanding uh, the curriculum and other uh, related uh, information. There's a, an article that leads that issue about uh, how uh, the presentations at the most, uh, or over the five years of the uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, cyber summit, uh, the 3CS conference, uh, and, and how those presentations align with uh, the, the principles of Capacity-based mastery learning. There's an article about that, and then the, the glossary article, and then uh, a couple other uh, specific examples of uh, how uh, skill development can be fostered in education. And of course, that is the focus of the Cybersecurity Skills Journal. So again, if you have uh, projects we've been working on that you'd like to uh, submit as a manuscript uh, to the Cybersecurity Skills Journal, we encourage you to do that. Also, we're always looking for reviewers. So we have um, information on our website. Again, uh, if you'd like to be uh, considered to be a reviewer and become a fellow of the Cybersecurity Skills Journal, there's a, a link provided uh, on the website to, to get access to that as well. We are now at 2.45. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and participating. We hope you uh, received much from the session and have learned a bit about how you too can quickly develop uh, assessment items that are more diagnostic and enable us to improve the educational experience of our learners and increase the cybersecurity capability maturity of everyone. Thank you again for attending. We hope to see you at a future virtual brown bag lunch. As a reminder, they occur on the first, I'm sorry, on the second 
Tuesday, Wednesday, man, I'm having a hard time today, on the second Wednesday and Friday of every month. So the next session will be on the second Wednesday and Friday of December. We hope to see you then. Have a wonderful day and a very, very happy Thanksgiving. So long, everybody.